Jesus, you don't need any commandments or laws. That's the bottom line. Uh, it is largely uh, the basis of most liberal theology today. Uh, it was a major component in the Seminex walkout in the, in the 60s, was that? Uh, or, or, or right around 70. Um, this whole idea of the law doesn't really matter as long as you have Jesus. Uh, and you still see that in, in a number of pastors of that era that went through that whole Seminex training. That's kind of a hallmark of that whole theology. You can be loosey-goosey with theology because as long as you got Jesus in your heart, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's antinomianism. So, all right. So the main proponent of this, or the guy who kind of is often considered the father of it among Lutherans anyway, is a guy named Johannes Agricola. Uh, originally a friend of Luther's, um, who created a controversy in the 1530s by preaching and teaching that repentance and forgiveness should only be preached on the basis of the gospel. That is, the law should not be preached to Christians to terrify them of their sin. So this Agricola guy was from Eisleben. Uh, and when Luther writes against him, he very often talks about that Eislebener. Uh, and he tried to stay, he, I mean, he was friends with the guy. And he tried to, tried to be friendly with him at first, but every time he would think he'd get the guy straightened out and walk away from him, a little while later he'd start writing and preaching the same thing again. So he, he kept backsliding into this error, and every time Luther would write a, an article against the antinomians, it would get kind of turn up the heat and get a little harsher each time uh, because he was losing patience because this guy would not learn. He kept coming back to the same sins. So here are kind of four main elements to Agricola's teaching. One, repentance is to be taught not from the Decalogue, that's Ten Commandments, or from any law of Moses, but from the volition of the Son through the Gospel. So you don't teach repentance by the commandments or the law, you teach it by the love of God in Jesus. So if you want to make somebody sorry for their sins, rather than point out the danger of their sin, how it's a violation of God's word, you teach them about the love of Jesus. So, yeah, you, I mean, how well does that work parenting? Your kid won't obey you, no matter what you say. So rather than, than turn up the law and, and say, if you do this again, there's going to be this punishment, you just tell them, but Jesus loves you. Exactly. If your kids aren't afraid a little bit, you're doing something wrong. Because a kid raised without the law will turn into a brat every time. All right, next one. In order to keep the Christian doctrine pure, we must resist those, that is Luther and Melanchthon, who taught that the gospel must be preached only to such whose hearts have previously been terrified and broken by the law. So yeah, Luther did in fact teach, uh, as in fact the Lutheran fathers have since the days of Luther, that the function of the law, the main function of the law, is to terrify sinners of their sin, to make them see their need of a savior. They, they have to recognize the fact they can't save themselves, and what they've done is going to earn them a place in hell if they don't have the inter intervention of a savior. That's the purpose of the law, uh, not according to Agricola. Uh, Agricola says you shouldn't scare people with the law. Um, just, again, tell them about the love of Jesus, and that's going to make it all better. So, you know, there's no need to tell prostitutes that they need to stop doing what they're doing because it's a violation of God's law. Just tell them about the love of Jesus. And they keep right on doing what they're doing, but thinking they're loved by Jesus now. Uh, next one. There is need of a doctrine which does not only condemn with great efficacy, 
but which saves at the same time. This, however, is the gospel, a doctrine which teaches conjointly repentance and the remission of sins. And this is, this is a confusion that you still see among the modern pop Christian evangelicals today. Uh, the idea that the gospel isn't just forgiveness, but it's like a combination message of law and gospel. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's Jesus loves you, um, be a good person kind of thing. It's, it's oh, how, how to put it, um, don't be like those people, Jesus loves you. You know, be a better person, Jesus loves you, as if that's the gospel. And, and it's kind of a, be a better person, then Jesus will love you, and then you'll be a better person. So it's, it's like you sandwich Jesus in between this command to be nicer and better, and this somehow is the gospel, which really is not the gospel at all. The gospel is, Jesus loves you, period. He forgives you, period. Um, according to these guys, there has to be this, this amendment of life, this fix, fixing one's life, and then Jesus will reward it, and, and Jesus will bless it after the fact, too. You, you're putting law in the middle of gospel. You're corrupting what the gospel is. Last point. In the New Testament and among Christians, uh, or in the gospel, we must not preach the violation of the law when a man breaks or transgresses the law, but the violation of the Son, to wit, that he does not, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, willingly omit what he should emit, omit, and does not do what he should do, and that he crucifies Christ anew. So, okay, so if somebody sins, again, use our prostitute example, catch, catch uh, someone in prostitution, it's not you're breaking God's law. Your soul is in danger. It's Jesus loves you, so this isn't what you should do. You know, it, it's, all, it's always this kind of softer, gentler kind of Christianity without the fear or condemnation of the law. It, it, it prefigures marvelously the way modern liberals think. This is their teaching. All right, so now Luther's writings about it. Next page. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely hard. And you usually face stiff criticism when you are harsh with the law and say, you are, you are in violation of God's word, you should not do this. And and uh, a lot of times, people will try to defray the impact of that by blaming you for being too blunt or mean. Maybe it's your approach that's the problem. Well, we, know, we know ourselves better than anybody. And when we tell someone what they're doing wrong, it's like, oh, what about you? you know? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I had, that, I had a situation like that a long time ago when someone was living with another person, you know, out of wedlock, sinfully, ran to another LCMS church, that pastor had no problem with it. Um, I called that pastor up and said, what are you doing? Uh, he says, gee, maybe the problem here is your approach, because you weren't, you weren't very nice. I said, you are confirming this person in their sin. You're telling them it's okay to keep doing what they're doing. Can't you see that you're putting their soul in danger? Nope, couldn't see it at all. The problem was my problem because I wasn't nice enough. I was too mean by saying, you're breaking God's law. You need to stop this. Yeah. So that kind of stuff is, is even in the LCMS. And you will face criticism when you're firm with the law. And you'll face, well, you're just the biggest sinner. Who are you to say anything to me? You know, well, when you're speaking God's law, it's not you saying something to another person. It's God saying something to another person. You're the mouthpiece. So it's, yep, I'm as big a sinner as you are. And the laws apply to me the same as you do. 
this law applies to you. Uh, and your soul's in danger. All right, so uh, now Luther's writings on it, top of page two. It is most surprising to me that anyone can claim that I reject the law of the Ten Commandments. Okay, stop here. So this Agricola guy was, was uh, saying that this is Luther's teaching, that he's the one who said the law really doesn't apply. Uh, and part of it is because Luther wrote something called the freedom of the Christian, which we'll talk about in a minute here. And Agricola totally misunderstood it. So, all right, so it's most surprising to me that anyone can claim that I reject the law or the Ten Commandments, since there is available in more than one edition my exposition of the Ten Commandments, which furthermore are daily preached and practiced in our churches. I'm not even mentioning the confession and the apology in our other books. Furthermore, the commandments are sung in two versions, as well as painted, printed, carved, and recited by the children morning, noon, and night. I know of no manner in which I do not use them, unless it be that we unfortunately do not practice and paint them with our deeds in our life as we should. I myself, as old and learned as I am, recite the Ten Commandments daily, word for word, like a child. So if anyone, perchance, gained some other impression from my writings, and yet saw and perceived that I stressed the catechism so greatly, he might in all fairness have addressed me and said, Dear Dr. Luther, how was it that you emphasize the Ten Commandments so much, though your teaching is that they are to be discarded? Uh, that is what they should have done, and not work secretly behind my back and waited for my death, after which they could make of me what they would, I know, ah, well, let them be forgiven who cease doing this. And he's talking about Agricola here. So yeah, uh, now the first uh, diamond there, Luther wrote works on the freedom of the Christian, which were misinterpreted as statements against obedience to the law. These writings were intended to combat the Roman Catholic view of using the law as a path to heaven, as if one could earn heaven through obedience to the law. He wrote that fully forgiven children of God are no longer compelled to keep God's law to obtain salvation. Well, Agricola understood that to mean they're no longer compelled to keep God's law, period. And Luther does say things like when dealing with the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He does say things like this commandment doesn't apply to us anymore. What he meant by that is we're not obligated to keep it like the Jews did. You know, they had no work on Sunday, period. Uh, you couldn't light a fire. You couldn't pick up sticks in your yard. Luther says that doesn't apply to us anymore. So people take statements like that and just run with them and ignore everything else he said. And this is what Agricola was doing. Uh, next one. The law is, uh, was a devotional tool for Luther and part of his daily piety. I mean, he really means it when he says every, every day part of his devotion was to recite the commandments. Uh, you're never too old to recite the commandments. Uh, every, every single morning, he went through all 10 of them and recited them. Uh, it's, in fact, it's a very good practice. It's also a good devotional practice prior to taking communion. Um, sitting in your pew, you can open up that catechism section of the hymnal and just read through the commandments and think about your life in comparison to them. So the commandments are devotional, as well as you know, life-shaping. Uh, next one, he was an ardent proponent of having children memorize the commandments. Uh, yes, uh, Luther did require the children to memorize the catechism, which is the commandments, the creed, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and then the uh, discussion on the Office of the Keys, Confession. Um, and the third one, that's the scare, last one that's escaping my brain. Uh, but he, he did, re what? Lord's Supper and Baptism, yeah, that's it. So he did, he did require them to memorize. Uh, I still do in confirmation class. It's a good practice at home away from confirmation class is a devotional thing. Um, most churches have given up memory work because the kids don't like it and the parents don't want to make their kid memorize. I'm too stubborn to give that up. 
and I don't care if they don't want to do it. So, yeah. It's good for the soul to know this stuff by heart. Because when you're faced with a situation where you don't have a book or a parent there to tell you what to do, but you have it on your heart, you know it. That's, that's what faith is. All right, so last one. He taught further that the commandments were God's prescription for how we are to love God and our neighbor. And this is maybe the other element Agricola did not understand. You know, he's, he's all about motivating people by the love of Jesus. Uh, and Luther did talk about the commandments as love. Uh, but not ignoring the commandments as love, which is what Agricola wanted to do. Luther said the commandments teach you how to love someone. Don't kill them. Don't commit adultery on, with their wife. You know, don't steal. Don't talk bad about them. Don't covet their stuff. That's how you love your neighbor. All right, any comments thus far? All right, next section from Luther. To be sure, I did teach and still teach that sinners shall be stirred to repentance through the preaching or contemplation of the passion of Christ. So they might see the enormity of God's wrath over sin and learn that there is no other remedy for this than the death of God's son. Is, uh, this doctrine is not mine, but St. Bernard's. What am I saying? St. Bernard's. This is the message of all Christendom, of all the prophets and apostles. But how can you deduce from this that the law is to be cast aside? I cannot find such a deduction in my logic textbook. I should like to see or hear the master who could demonstrate it. Does anyone imagine that there can be sin where there is no law? Whoever abolishes the law must simultaneously abolish sin. If he permits sin to stand, he must most certainly permit the law to stand. For according to Romans 5, where there is no law, there is no sin. And if there is no sin, then Christ is nothing. Why should he die if there were no sin or law for which he must die? It is apparent from this that the devil's purpose in this fanaticism is not to remove the law, but to remove Christ, the fulfiller of the law. So yeah, as Luther points out, the gospel is not absent from preaching repentance. Uh, Jesus' suffering and death for us sinners, the gospel, does move Christians to denounce their sins. Uh, but the law also has a place condemning sinners so that they see their need to repent. Uh, Walther wrote a book called Law and Gospel. Walther's the founder of the Missouri Synod, uh, one of our best teachers, very insightful man. Um, he wrote a book on Law and Gospel in which he says that the law should only be preached exclusively the law, no gospel, not a hint of gospel, the law should be preached exclusively to unrepentant sinners. But to repentant sinners, you preach the law and the gospel. So this is what Luther is saying. There is a place for the contemplation of the suffering and death of Christ when you preach repentance. Uh, and that is, you know, this is what your sins cost God, the life of his son. Uh, but this is what God paid to forgive you, the gospel. Um, so yeah, the, it, for, for the repentant, they hear both. For the unrepentant, those who don't think they need to turn away from their sin, there is no, no gospel attached. Because as long as they won't repent, they are not forgiven, and they're on their way to hell. So you can't give them a false hope, which is what Agricola wanted to do. All right, next point. Uh, the true gospel is at stake when one misuses or eliminates the law. So how can Christ's sacrifice be salvific if the law has not condemned and threatened us with damnation? So yeah, liberalism that would say the law is irrelevant, don't worry about it. It's not the law they're offending, it's the gospel. It's people's salvation. Next uh, section from Luther now. Dear God, should it be unbearable that the Holy Church confesses itself a sinner, believes in the forgiveness of sins, and asks for remission of sin in the Lord's Prayer? How can one know what sin is without the law and conscience? 
And how will we learn what Christ is, what he did for us, if we do not know what the law is that he fulfilled for us, and what sin is for which he made satisfaction? And even if we did not require the law for ourselves, or if we could tear it out of our hearts, which is impossible, we would have to preach it for Christ's sake, as is done and, has, and as has to be done, so that we might know what he did and what he suffered for us. For who could know what and why Christ suffered for us without knowing what sin or law is? Therefore, the law must be preached wherever Christ is to be preached, even if the word law is not mentioned, so that the conscience is nevertheless frightened by the law when it hears that Christ had to fulfill the law for us at so great a price. And here are a few passages worth looking up to see that this whole debate really is something uh, that Paul and, and even St. John dealt with in their writings. Uh, this, the antinomian spirit, the against the law spirit or lawless spirit is certainly nothing new. It's identified, in fact, uh, if you remember from our discussion of Thess Thessalonians, as a mark of the Antichrist. So it, it's an anti-Christian doctrine which was alive and well even in apostolic days. Uh, Romans 3, 19 to 20, this is Paul dealing with almost exactly the same thing Luther is dealing now. Uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's its purpose. That's what Luther is saying. The law is there to show you your sin. We call this the second use of the law. Uh, there's three ways the law is used in Scripture. It's used as a, as a guide to tell you what to do uh, to please God. That's the third use of the law. It's used as a mirror to show you your own sins. Because every time you hear, you know, you shouldn't covet, you shouldn't give false testimony against others, you're reminded of what you've done yourself to others. And the, that's the second use. And the first use of the law is as a, a rule. Uh, to curb violent outbursts, so to keep us in line and in check, essentially, so we're not running around there like a bunch of anarchists um, raising hell in the world, which is what the anarchists do. So, boy, they've got the whole symphony going there. <laughs> so uh, the, the law serves three very important functions. A major one, and the main one in Lutheran preaching, is the second use where it's used to expose your sins and show you how much you need Jesus. So this is what Paul was dealing with. Also in Romans 5, chapter 20 to 21, chapter, verse 20 to 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the law entered, so the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded more. So the purpose of the law? To make sin obvious, to make sin abound. The law is there to show you your sin. Why? So that grace might abound, so that you might know Jesus actually forgives you that sin. So exactly what Luther is saying is what Paul was saying. Lastly, oh, yeah, lastly in Romans 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said, you shall not covet. So once more, the, the law is there to expose your sin. We wouldn't even know our sin is unless we got a law telling us it's wrong. And Paul points at covetousness because covetousness is one of those things that doesn't feel like a sin. In fact, if you're in business, covetousness is exactly what you want in a salesman. You want a guy who's particularly covetous to be a good salesman. Somebody who's, who's not content making, you know, minimum wage, making an adequate living. You don't want a guy like that. You want a guy who wants to be a millionaire, who's not content unless he's out there making that big sale to bring home the box, and he never gets enough. You know, that's the best salesman. And in business, that's what guys look for. 
So covetousness is a good thing in our world as far as that's concerned. And Paul's saying he wouldn't even know covetousness is wrong unless God said don't covet. Well, God did say don't covet. So it might be good for business. It's not so good for the soul. 1 John 3, 4, last citation here. 1 John 3, 4. Nope. That's 1 John. Yep, that is 1 first, so first John 3. Oh, I was looking at 3, 3. There we go. 3, 4 works much better. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So there you go. Again, what Luther is saying. Yeah. How, can you preach, how can you preach sin if you're not preaching the law? Because sin is breaking the law. How do you know what your sin is if you don't have a law telling you? It's just absurd. But if you read things, there's, a, there's an author, an ELCA writer. that I want to say horrible things about because, <laughs> because she's awful. Um, but I read her book called Shameless. Something naughty of Bowles Weber, is that it? Uh, anyway, she's, she's an ELCA female minister who likes wearing sleeveless bricks because it shows off her tattoos. Uh, brags in her book about giving her daughter permission to sleep with her boyfriend, about her own personal abortion she had, and about her congregation members that are made up mostly of sexual deviates. You know, um, the, the, the whole LGBT crowd is her congregation. And in this book, she's L claims to be Lutheran. You know, it's ELCA, which we know is not Lutheran, but claims to be. Uh, and in this book, she reasons exactly in this way. Jesus loves you. Don't let anybody tell you what you're doing is wrong. The law doesn't matter. We're free from the law under Jesus. You know, we are free to express our true selves, and Jesus is going to love us. There's no law to these people. There's no morality which goes with the law. And it's all covered up by Jesus. She's very popular not surprisingly, in her writing. All right. Any thoughts before we go to the next quote? All right. Next quote. They, the antinomians, that is Anabaptists. Anabaptists, Ana, Anabaptist literally means rebaptizer. They are, they are the uh, uh, forefathers of the modern uh, evangelical movement that thinks you have to rebaptize when you're older because the first one didn't count. They were doing this already in Luther's day. By the way, the Roman Catholics, uh, the Roman Catholics, when they dealt with Anabaptists, their method of dealing with them was to baptize them permanently. You want to be rebaptized? Okay. Drag them out to the river and drown them. That's how Roman Catholics dealt with Anabaptists. Um, at any rate, I'm not, I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that's historically what they did back then when they uh, dealt with Anabaptists. All right, so they, the antinomians Anabaptists, have devised for themselves a new method whereby one is to preach grace first and then the revelation of wrath. The word law is not to be heard or spoken. This is a nice little toy from which they derive much pleasure. They claim they can fit the entire scripture into this pattern, and thus they become the light of the world. That's the meaning they foist on St. Paul in Romans 1.18. But they fail to see that he teaches just the opposite. For he calls attention to the wrath of God from heaven and makes all the world sinners and guilty before God. Then after they have become sinners, he teaches them how to obtain mercy and be justified. That is what the first three chapters powerfully and clearly demonstrate. It is also indicative of particular blindness and stupidity when they claim that the revelation of God's wrath is something different from the law. This is, of course, impossible, for the manifestation of wrath is the law when it is acknowledged and felt, just as St. Paul says, the law brings wrath. 
So haven't they fixed things smartly when they abolish the law and yet teach it by proclaiming the revelation of wrath? But they reverse the order of things and teach the law after they teach the gospel and wrath after grace. And the perfect description of modern evangelicals, the salt company in, in Iowa State, the non-denominational churches. It's all Jesus is love and Jesus loves you. Now you better go out and be a good Christian and, and show yourself worthy of that. You know, you better do this. You better go to so many uh, prayer meetings. You better uh, uh, give so much. A whole laundry list of things you got to do. So using the gospel as kind of a, 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 a law motivator. Uh, as uh, the, the first diamond there says, this is still the air of the evangelical movement that is non-denominational Baptist-type theology today. It's the message of God is love, but you have to earn it through your obedience, and if you aren't obedient enough, God won't bless you. Yeah, that's the other side of it. You want God's blessings, then you do this, do that, do this, do that. Grace is a carrot on a stick that motivates your obedience as you try to reach it. It is not a free gift that saves you from God's wrath. And this is, a, uh, this is an example of this, a, a mission statement from a church that my daughter showed me this. I thought I'd share it with you. So this is, this is a, a current church today, and this is their mission statement. We seek to connect all people to life-defining relationships in Christ. His grace can change our destiny. His life can make us whole. We're both a team of servants and a family of brothers and sisters loved by God and growing into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We believe God's Spirit's continually adding people to his family. Simply put, life is about relationships. God loves us. We love God and love people. Uh, and, and God loves people and we do too. So it's all about the love of God and your relationships. It is not about needing a savior because you're going to hell without one. See, it, it, it's, a, it's a marvelous way of writing Jesus right out of the story and still have something called the love of God. Jesus is no longer savior in this model. Yes. That is a good question. What does that mean to have a relationship with Christ? I mean, unbelievers also have a relationship with Christ. Not a good one. Not a saving one. It's emotions-based. You know, it's all emotion. That's what having a relationship with Jesus is to them. You have to have the right emotional uh, attachment to Jesus. Well, you may know you are, but as far as they're concerned, if you don't feel it, then how do you know it? You know, we know it because we're baptized and we're declared forgiven and we get forgiveness every week. That's how we know we're loved by Jesus, not because we feel it. So you cannot feel it and still be completely loved by Jesus because you get his grace all the time. Feeling can't define grace, but they do define grace by feeling, and that's the difference. All right, next Luther quote, last Luther quote, in fact. Uh, Even if I were to love another love, I think it should be live, I think it's a typo. Even if I were to live another hundred years and should succeed by the grace of God, not only in allying the past, and present storms and rabbles, but also future ones, I realize that the devil lives in rules. Therefore, I'm also praying for a gracious hour of death. I can no more keep this life. I, excuse me. I care no more for this life. I exhort you, our posterity, to pray and to pursue the word of God with diligence. Keep God's poor candle burning. Be warned and be on alert watching lest at any hour the devil try to break a pane or a window or fling open a door or tear off the roof in order to extinguish the light, for he will not die before the last day. You and I have to die, but after our death he still remains the same as he has always been, unable to desist from his raging. 
So he, Luther very firmly makes this a demonic thing. Even though Agricola was a friend, their friendship is over at this point. Uh, and Agricola has become a servant of the devil. Yeah, Luther wrote this about five years before his death, by the way. Okay, any thoughts or comments on Luther's writing? Now, after Luther's death, he died in the 1540s. I want to say 1545 or 44. Um, after his death, uh, he was kind of an anchor that held the Reformation together. And after his death, a lot of various errors started creeping in, uh, including this antinomian thing. It never went away. So in 1560, the next generation of Lutherans had to address it again. And they wrote something called the Formula of Concord. Uh, this is another confession of faith. Uh, and in the Formula of Concord, they specifically address this antinomian thing under an article that talks about the third use of the law, which is the law as a, as a guide telling us what to do to, be, to please God. So here's, here's how they, in the 1560s now, about 20 years after Luther wrote this, this is how the next generation of Lutherans addressed the problem. So the principal question in this controversy, uh, since the law was given to men for three reasons, first, that they outwardly, uh, that they thereby outward, dis oh boy, that thereby outward discipline might be maintained against wild disobedient men and that wild and intractable men might be restrained as though by certain bars. Secondly, that men thereby may be led to not the knowledge of their sins. And thirdly, that they are regenerate. They might have a fixed rule according to which they are to regulate and direct their whole life. So the, this is the third point there that we're talking about, that we have a, a rule according to which to shape our lives. So a dissension has occurred between some fellow theologians concerning the third use of the law, namely, whether it is to be urged upon regenerate Christians, the one side has said yes, the other no. So do you have to tell Christians what to do to please God? And there's, we still have this debate today, unfortunately, in the church. There are those who say the law should not be stressed to people who are Christians, because once you get the Holy Spirit, you by nature know what to do to please God which would be a marvelous thing if that's the way the human nature actually worked. You know, but unfortunately, our human nature is always there messing things up inside. So we may know what's right, but that doesn't mean we don't need to hear it over and over again because we're not going to follow it. You know, human nature is corrupting, so we need to constantly be redirected by the law. Uh, some say you don't. So affirmative theses, what we actually believe. We believe, teach, and confess that although men truly believing in Christ and truly converted to God have been freed and exempted from the curse and coercion of the law, they nevertheless are not on this account without law, but have been redeemed by the Son of God in order that they should exercise themselves in it day and night, that they should meditate upon God's law day and night and constantly exercise themselves in its observance. So, yeah, the law doesn't condemn us, but that doesn't mean we're not obligated to keep it. We should strive to keep the law. Two, we believe, teach, and confess that preaching of the law is to be urged with diligence, not only upon the unbelieving and impenitent, but also upon true believers who are truly converted, regenerate, and justified by faith. Everybody needs a reminder of what God expects of us. Uh, uh, not just the unbelievers. Uh, three, for although they are regenerate and renewed in the spirit of their mind, yet in the present life, this regeneration and renewal is not complete but only begun. And believers are, by the spirit of their mind, in a constant struggle against the corrupt nature. It is needful that the law of the Lord always shine before them. So because we're broken, we need to be reminded of this. If we weren't broken, you wouldn't need to be reminded of it. In heaven, there won't be a law. You won't need a law in heaven. You will by nature do what is right by God. In this life, we by nature do what's wrong. Yes. We're from daily, we need laws. They put signs up on the side of the road telling us how fast to drive and so 
Absolutely. Do you follow them? <laughs> Which also shows the power of the law. You can make up all the rules you want. All you do is make people worse sinners. You don't actually get the obedience you're looking for. When I went to Russia years ago, uh, they took me to a train museum. I, uh, the, the people handling us, they wanted to show us something nice, took us to a train museum. And there are signs on these trains that say, don't climb on the trains. Uh, and the Russians told me that's what the sign says, and then said, so you know what we Russians do when we see signs telling us what not to do? We do it. And she jumps on the train and starts walking around on it. You know, and th that's, that's all the good the law does. It shows you the fact, it just makes you a bigger sinner. And every year when our blessed country makes more laws and our legislators make more laws and more rules, all they're doing is making more people sinful, more people breaking laws. They're not making a better country or making us more law-abiding. Yeah, so at any rate, yes, the laws are there to control outbursts. Uh, it, they just don't work like they should because we're not, re we're not regenerate enough yet. Four, as regards the distinction between the works of the law and the fruits of the Spirit, we believe, teach, and confess that the works which are done according to the law are works of the law as long as they are only exhorted from man by urging the punishment and threatening of God's wrath. This goes with number five. Fruits of the Spirit, however, are works which the Spirit of God, who dwells in believers, works through the regenerate and which are done by believers so far as they are regenerate. So in other words, the law will hit unbelievers and believers differently. Unbelievers will do the law because they have to, because they are coerced by the law to do so. Believers will do the law because they know this is what pleases God and they want to please God. There's a, there's a different spirit behind keeping the law, even though two people might be keeping exactly the same law. Uh, or, or motivation out of different loves, too. You know, Bill Gates is a very generous guy. He gives away a lot of money to charity. Um, he's an atheist. But he's very charitable. He gives away more money every year in charity than I'll make in a lifetime. Um, but why? Not, be, not out of love of God. Maybe you could claim it's out of love of humanity. You know, maybe you could claim it's out of love of the tax code and trying to evade paying taxes. Uh, there are many different motivations, but love of God is not among them. Whereas Christians who give to charity, love of God is the first reason. So, all right, last, last point. Uh, thus the law is and remains both to the penitent and impenitent, both regenerate and unregenerate men, one and the same law, namely the immutable will of God and the difference so far as concerns obedience is alone in man, inasmuch as one who is yet not regenerate does for the law out of constraint and unwillingly what it requires of him, as also the regenerate do according to the flesh. But the believer, so far as he is regenerate, does without constraint and with a willing spirit that which no threatenings, however severe of the law, could ever extort from him. So false and contrary, accordingly we reject as a dogma and error injurious to and conflicting with Christian discipline and true godliness the teaching that the law is, uh, the law in the above mentioned way and degree is not to be urged upon Christians and true believers, but only upon unbelievers, non Christians, and the impenitent. All right, and my last two comments on the handout even churches that confess the need for the law may suffer from practical, a practical antinomianism. That is, they never follow through with the law. The, only is only, the, the law is only words without consequence. And you know, a lot of churches do this. They'll have, they'll have uh, 
they'll teach and preach against, say, living together before marriage. It's wrong, it's bad, don't do it. But there are never any consequences if somebody actually lives together without marriage in the congregation. They just ignore it. They'll preach about it publicly. They just, there's, there's no follow-through with any of it. And if that's what the church has become, then we are antinomians. If we're going to say something is right, there's got to be, there's got to be a follow-through when it's wrong. There need to be consequences or it's meaningless. It's the same as disciplining your kids. You know, you threaten your kids, you do this, uh, you do this, and you're going to get it in this way, and then they do it and you never follow through. They're going to get the message that it's okay to do whatever they want and you're never going to follow through. And they'll grow up to be brats. They have to know there are consequences and the church has to follow through with those consequences. Or the gospel itself is meaningless. What do you need a savior for if you're saved no matter what you do? All right. That's it for the antinomian controversy and Luther's writing. Any thoughts or questions about it? It is still an issue today. Uh, it is still something that we need to be reminded of because it's always threatening the church. And it's so easy. It's so easy to fall into. All right, let's close. Merciful Lord, we pray that you keep us from despising your law and that by your grace and by regenerating our heart, you may help us serve you better and show forth your righteousness in this world through our obedience to your word. Pray, amen.